Hello, I'd like to welcome all of you who are here to the, uh, the discussion that it's a rather hard one. Darwinism, why I believe, and it's titled Chemistry and Evolution. And I know that's an intriguing title, and I want to thank uh, UBF for having me here. First thing, why do a lecture like this? Well, the, the answer is, as I've talked, uh, I'm sometimes asked the question, and I'm a chemist, what about evolution? And uh, it's a hard question. I would like to answer it, and this lecture is that answer. Really, when people ask this, they're really not asking about evolution. People are asking me about Darwinism. And what I mean by that is something that is both philosophical as well as scientific. And uh, you may object to this, but Charles Darwin was far more philosophical than is often thought in his book uh, on the origin of species. Let me give you an example as well. Evolution is a fact. People say that. And then they draw a conclusion. Therefore, there is no, say, creator God. That's both philosophical as well as some would say scientific. Let me uh, hone in on this thing. You know, at first you might think, ah, oh, come on. What does chemistry have to do with evolution? Well, you know, a little. You know, there's separate fields of chemistry and separate fields of biology. Well, my answer is not little, it's much. And that's what I'm going to attempt to show you in today's lecture. Um, what I'm going to have to do is describe a little bit the central theory in the, uh, of biology, that is, evolution is said to be that. And the great question of biology is, how did life arise? That's evolution. Is it true? evolution? Well, I'm going to give the answer I've often given, yes and no. And in today's lecture, I have to describe to you what I mean by yes and no. But I am a skeptic to the common understanding. So I'm in the skeptic column. I will attempt to show why, as a chemist, I do not agree with the statement evolution is true. But I do say yes, it is true in some sense. So we're going to look at evolution in the eyes of chemistry. Now, immediately you might think, Chemistry? I haven't heard this before. You mean chemistry is a challenge to Darwin's theory of evolution? Who puts that out? Well, not many. Really. And uh, why isn't this more widely known? Well, that's a good question. I think in part because it's hard to teach. And you'll see that today and why I'm doing that. Here is the common way we understand evolution. If we have on our y-axis time and a characteristic of a certain uh, organism on the x-axis, you know, there's a bell curve variation or some type of variation. And over time, that's what we had, the organism stays the same. And then if the environment changes or there's some other change, the, this characteristic may start to shift, as shown there, over to the right. And over time, there may be a separation of one species on one side versus another side. And this could be squirrels over the Grand Canyon or anything you would want to say. On one side of the Grand Canyon, there's one species of squirrel. And on the north side of the Grand Canyon, there's another species of squirrel. This is how evolution is thought of. But where is chemistry? Not here, is it? It uh, doesn't seem to fit, or does it? This is what I want you to look at. Something I call Darwin's engine. And uh, this would be the modern biological understanding. A huge amount of biology is dedicated to this. What is this? That's a good question. Let me start with that. I have two posters. One showing the genetic code and how it works, as well as other aspects of 
how we reproduce. That's what's shown here and also on the slide over there. Why do I show you this? Because this is life. But this is Darwin's engine, how it works. And what you find on here are little detailed structures showing you sometimes uh, some molecules as well as how we understand the process to operate. It is complicated, and that is the problem. It is not an easy picture to understand. People talk about DNA, and obviously there's a lot more here than just DNA. Ask anyone who's involved in chemistry, uh, and biochemistry particularly, and you, uh, you immediately know that a replication system, which is what this is about, uh, takes a great deal of chemistry in it, doesn't it? This is where the chemistry comes in. The next point I'm going to make about this is um, this is the replication system. What I showed you in the previous slide had to do with replication of life and change of life. And it's not magic. It happens to be chemistry. I've showed you the biochemical pathways chart relying on the replication system. But there's more to it than that. This is really a network of chemical reactions, and so is life itself. Now, in the cell, it's been equated to a factory, and this is a quote from a biology book that's well-known and well-used in the United States. Um, the living cell is, as it says, a chemical industry. There are thousands and thousands of reactions that occur within the space of one cell. Now this is the chemistry that is occurring and there's two things that I want you to see in these things. One is the replication system and the other is just the chemistry associated with life. What does it look like? This is the other poster that I have. I'm going to go back and I'll show you the poster in just a bit. The cell does a lot of things. The cell is everything that we are and operate, but it does so on a chemical level through re chemical reactions. Now, why do I tell you all this? Because you may not have considered the cell in this manner. If it is a factory, we have to worry about supplies, what goes into it, what we use it, energy that is used to operate it, the structure of the cell itself and how it operates, how the reactions work. And then finally, product and waste removal. All of these are going to be considerations. And there's one final thing. I have a little thing called shape in there. Notice that I'm talking shape about the infrastructure, how we get the factory to operate, and what it operates on, supplies and energy. Energy really uses shape, and so does the uh, infrastructure. If we look at the cell itself, this is showing you the biochemical path of the chemistry of life. This is the major parts of life chemistry for almost all organisms. And it is quite complicated, and indeed it has to be. The thing in the center is shown to you on the screen, the citric acid cycle to which any biochemistry student has been forced to memorize every detail of it. The citric acid cycle is shown on there is what is used for energy generation, as well as to make metabolites. It is an essential part of it. I'm just showing you this so you see that chemistry is involved in life. That uh, we do not, in fact, distinguish between these two things, biology and chemistry. In life, they are together. Pause. Okay. So my core issues. Evolution, really, the change in life, is going to involve the realms of biology and chemistry, the two realms together. Notice the quote on the bottom. From biology, the book by Campbell, and he's, he's telling you that you have to put these two together. Chemistry 
we're going to consider chemical reactions. What are these? When we take two chemicals and add them together, we go from reactants to products. Something is happening inside the cells. Whether we talk about Darwinian evolution, whether we talk about chemistry, metabolism, any of this stuff that's associated, there's always a chemical reaction associated with it. It's never simple. Ever. It's never simple. So, biology arises from chemistry in action. There's just no other way around that. So what's the big deal? The rules of chemistry apply to evolution. And chemistry has limitations. That is essential to know. If the chemistry is impossible or likely, two possibilities, then neither is biology. And finally, as a re reminder, Functioning biochemistry is not simple. We should never consider it as such. All right. All right. As we go through this lecture, here's what I want you, and I'm going to take you through a set of different points. Each of the points is going to illustrate the problems of chemistry or the limitations of chemistry. So evolution is the change of life as it develops from one generation to the other, are the changes? Uh, chemistry can do two things. It can hinder these changes, a hindrance towards change, as well as it can remove any gain that may said to have been possible through the Darwinian process. So here's my point. I believe that there is a Darwinian process, that there can be something that changes life. It's part of the chemistry of life. It's changeable. We know that dogs can change. We've seen the changes in life. We know changes are real. Changes can be improvements. But I'm going to say that chemistry can hinder that change or even remove the gain. So this is what I'm going to attempt to show you in the lecture. I don't even go there. And it isn't even necessary to do that, uh, to talk between a distinction between macro and micro. And you'll get why uh, as we progress. In chemistry, two principles apply. There's thermodynamic principles. And these are going to be a reaction towards equilibrium. There's going to be a specific direction. Once one direction is going to be spontaneous, the opposite direction is non-spontaneous. In other words, it doesn't occur. As we go towards equilibrium, there's always going to be a direction towards reaction. Is it so what? I don't get what that has to do with anything. Well, what this does is tell me I can't make everything. I can make only the direction in which thermodynamics allows. The next one is how fast it goes there. The first point of thermodynamics is, uh, is which direction can it go to happen? The second point is how fast. There's a third one on the Chartier's principle, but that is on an equilibrium process. And here I am done discussing equilibrium processes. I'm talking about these two. And I will, in the next few slides, Take the principles of these and apply them to evolution as we are going along. So, hold on to yourself as we do this. All right. Boltzmann, the scatterer. Ludwig Boltzmann has an equation shown up at the top here. All you need to know that entropy is called S, and it applies to the Gibbs free energy which is the term delta S on the end of the equation. If the delta G term is negative, the, the, uh, it's spontaneous. If it's positive, it's non-spontaneous. This sets the direction of all life and greatly restricts what we can do. Everyone knows this, and it's taught in all the classes. Okay, so where am I going to go with this? In life, we are not what we eat. I know that you've often heard we are what we eat, but this is not true. The way life chemistry works is that we take we we can take complicated molecules and food, and they're all actually broken down in a catabolic process. They're made into simpler molecules, and they're rearranged through anabolic processes back into the complex molecules as well as energy. This is the quick summary of this. What does this have to do with 
what I'm showing above. Several points. You can't simply by adding temperature or enzymes or anything like that drive the process from simple to complex. It's in fact held up by a Boltzmann process. What does Boltzmann do? It says that I will break down complicated things and make them simpler. That's what this equation is actually saying. So there's very insidious a breakdown process that is occurring here where simpler is going to be the answer and it's going to be taking ordered states to disordered states. That's going to have an impact upon a Darwinian evolution or should I call Darwin's engine. It has been said that Darwin and Boltzmann are in competition. How do we get the anabolic process to work? Well, in our biochemistry, we do this through coupled reactions. Let me try to help explain this a bit. This is a diagram of something called the hydraulic ram. Did you know that water can actually flow uphill? You don't see water flowing uphill. Water flows downhill. But we can engineer it to end up at a higher state than when it first started. And you can do this through something called the hydraulic ram. If you're interested, remember the name, look it up. What's important is there's two sets of valves there and water flows up. Here's the important part, part time. This is a coupled reaction in which I, um, I can get it to work, but it only functions when everything is there. That's the take home message. If everything is there and I get directed energy, it works. Without the directed energy and everything being there, I cannot couple energy. The same thing is true on chemical reactions as I did with the hydraulic ram. That's a can of spam. I wonder what it's doing there. Well, let me put it this way. We are chemicals. Everything we eat is a chemical. They're organic chemicals. Food is an organic chemical. It is not a special category of organics that you go into a store. I'm a chemist. Organic chemistry is a course and it relates to a certain class of molecules made out of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and so on. What's important? How long is the shelf life of a can of Spam? Who cares? Well, you might because this is of a wet product, this has got the longest shelf life. Anyone know how long it is? Five years. You're right, five years. And um, that's it. After five years, the flavor, that's usually what they base it on, will be impacted. And notice it's a completely canned container, sealed off from oxygen, just water present, and so on. And that's how long organic chemicals last. So, what's the take-home message? Chemicals, organic chemicals, don't live long. They have a short life. Now I'm hinting at the thing that I'm going to get in the next slides. The previous slide, I talked to you about thermodynamics and how re reactions are restricted. We'll talk about restrictions as they come along. And then the second part is how long they last. Where are we going? Remember, we're going to go towards equilibrium. So the first thing is expiration dates. We find them on pharmaceuticals. All your medicines, though they're dry, the tablets die out and we have to throw them away. What does this have to do with evolution? Why, we are organic chemicals too. Everything we make breaks down. The information associated with any gain in evolution is also subject to the same set of parasitic reactions. And they actually tug against a positive direction or improvement in life. These will erase improvements. These type of reactions, they seem you know, simple, but they're actually the reactions that erase your DNA, change your DNA, modify your life codes, allow it not to form, hinder reactions by, by side reaction. Okay. The refrigerator. You know what this teaches us? 
it teaches us that life has windows. You know that a refrigerator holds back growth of, of bacterial life, particularly funguses and bacteria and other stuff, so they don't grow. They also might kill them. They are short, small windows in temperature that are useful for life. So, unfortunately, due to the massive set of different reactions that we're dealing with, change the kinetics even slightly, and guess what? We touch the ability to life for form, to grow, to be able to mutate, or do anything that is needed. What else do we learn? Here's a quote. The ATP, that is your energy generation cycle, moves at an astonishing pace. For example, a working muscle cell recycles the entire pool of DNA once each minute. That turnover represents 10 million molecules of ATP consumed and regenerated per second per cell. If ATP could not be generated by the phosphorylation of ADP, humans would consume nearly their body weight in ATP each day. Reactions have to be facile, extremely facile. Efficient chemistry is essential. That's kind of what we saw in the previous slide, but this looks at just the energy. We need this for our energy. Without it being fast and working well, it only will work when it's well. We won't have life. Here's a quote out of a book, Principles of Biochemistry. The highlighted section, maintaining the living state requires that selected chemical transformations occur very rapidly, in particular those required to make efficient use of energy sources in the environment and to synthesize the elaborate and specialized macromolecules found in the cell. What's he saying? We need it fast. We need it right. We need energy sources to be there available immediately or we run out of power and we run out of metabolites and other things that are needed for life. We have here a second type of tolerance window for life. One is the ATP tolerance window. We had to have it fast, and here we have to have certain reactions or else we cannot have biochemistry occurring at all. That's the message. Next message in time, let's look at geology. What happens if we take the science point of view of the Earth, it's old? What happens to time in geology? Reactions are slow. Did you know that mountains are said to react the way that rocks react very slowly? They rot, so to speak. And these reactions are extremely slow. Have you seen a rock decompose? I visited a park just the other day, and it had uh, it had a hundred-year-old granite stone that was uh, starting to show signs of weathering, chemical weathering as well as physical weathering. But it took a hundred years for it to show the signs of weathering, and it was granite. So I saw a granite rock that was corroding. Um, you know what we get over time? Sand. It's the most stable part. A mountain range is said to decompose into sand. How long does it take? About 10 million to 50 million years. That's what the geologists tell us. This is also the time span it takes for a species to spend its time on the Earth. So says the paleontologist. Strangely enough, life though is far more fragile than mountains, yet species are more durable. Something is odd. Right? Time in chemistry. Time does not make new things in chemistry. Remember where time goes? All reactions go towards equilibrium. Equilibrium is the end of the road. Once we hit it, they're gone. So time makes old, not new. Time wears out, produces aging and decay. In this sense, time is not a friend. All right? Did you know that this is true? Time brings death. These are chemical reactions. Why don't you just ponder with me for a moment. You go to the 
the hospital and they give you your, your labs. You know what the labs are? Results of chemical testing. They're looking at the results of chemistry going awry inside your body. Why is it when we look at biology that time is viewed as special and creative, but in life chemistry, which it's made out of, it's not? So we have a dilemma. Is biology actually special? Chemists see things very differently from biology. We have to answer that question. Right? I need to spend just a moment on organics. This is an organic molecule, caffeine. We have a ring structure. That's what you see, in fact, two rings. We have some double bonds, those are the double lines. We have amines and amides. They are reactive, there's functionality to this molecule. This molecule has biological importance in many ways. As you know, you drink uh, a caffeinated drink, you feel kind of perked up, maybe a little bit uh, hypered, and uh, it's a fair question. Could this molecule be made by Darwinian evolution? It's a fair question. It's one that people would answer yes, but we should consider it. And so now I show you something that I want to introduce to you. And I need to do this because this could be called the biochemical caffeine synthesis pathway. It was taken out of lit literature. The molecule on the left, exanthocene, can be reacted through a set of molecules, something called SAM to SAH, that's shown here in the first set. And we go through and we change each of the molecules, and I hope you can see the step-by-step -step process. What am I showing you here is that to make a molecule like caffeine from a known metabolite inside plants, the first molecule, not all plants have caffeine, we have to take it through a stepwise linear process using four enzymes plus a set of different molecules. That's what we mean by a biochemical pathway. All biochemistry operates like this. There's no exception. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little hammer here, a little hammer there, and voila, the end product. Can evolution make this? That's an interesting question. So now I'm going to look at, in a set of the next slides, I've covered just the issues of time. In the next slides, I'm going to cover problems for Darwinian, the Darwin's engine to operate. First problem is that the same system is found in all the life forms. The organisms vary greatly, but the engine does not vary. That's a problem. Let's imagine universal acid. That's, said, that's something that comes out of chemistry. It's said to eat through everything, including its own container. So what can hold it? How you can work with it? If we have a change mechanism in life, wouldn't it modify itself too? Yet we have found that the engine, Darwin's engine, doesn't modify itself. It modifies other forms of life, of the life. Inside the cell, it seems to be able to modify, but itself doesn't. Um, I would suggest, though, if you're going to differ with me here at this point, to consult the biochemistry text for the differences in the operation of the genetic system between the different forms of life. So it's just a caveat. But in, a, but in its basic form, it's the same. So one of the problems is that the organisms can vary greatly. We have to account for it. Well, the same system doesn't touch itself. Chemistry is small, much, much smaller than biology. It has many parts, and they're all regulated. The process that I showed you with thermodynamics as well as kinetics are as a non-regulated process. There is no regulation found within the chemistry itself. Regulation as it's found in life organisms is found in the biochemistry. There are on-off switches that have to be made. A great deal of complexity is associated with the regulation, far more than just the reaction itself. It is, in fact, the bulk of what goes on in the biochemistry. I've showed you briefly that biochemistry follows pathways. I'm going to tell you that 
that chemistry is spatially limited. And I've given you just a hint that biochemical reactions have a concern to be rapid. And this uh, and I put that in quotes. And what I mean here is that the speed of the reaction is how you often get regulation that is control in your body's biochemistry. I would love to go into details and read you about how, what our cells do and how they operate. Just put it this way, that if our organic chemistry didn't work as well as it did, we'd die very quickly. That's all I want to say at this stage. Let me go through some of these things that I allude to. Macromolecules, a, a task that we need to consider. What I mean by a macromolecule? Something that is very large, and we often think of them in terms of proteins. And I show here on the bottom for a cell. And in the cell, there is a mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, there's a membrane on the mitochondria. If you remember your biology, there's a mitochondria. This is where your energy generation is, is made. And energy is one of the essentials. I've alluded to it. And in that little part of the cell, and I don't have a pointer anymore, uh, but there's something called cytochrome C found right there. Just a little molecule. I just want to point that out to you. And there has to be an electron transport through this membrane for this reaction to occur. Just hold that thought. I'm going to show you here a picture of the 20 amino acids used to make protein. Proteins are made out of these different types. Aren't they pretty? Maybe for a chemist. Maybe if you're not a chemist, you don't find them pretty. But that's your tough luck. Uh, I think it's rather neat uh, that we have two sides uh, to it, an amine side and a carboxylic acid side, and they join together to make chains as shown here. So the thing on the left is these 20 molecules can be joined to form a chain. These chains can loop together to form a cluster found there, and that could be an enzyme. And that's what we show here, the DNA polymerase 1 uh, macromolecule. So that's what we mean by a macromolecule. Here is, in life organisms, the top line is the human cytochrome C molecule given to you in code. Those are part of the 20 of them that are found there. They've been given letter codes, and you say, big deal. Next to it are some of the other organisms and their variations. Notice that certain parts of these molecules are said to be essential. They don't vary in life, and others do vary. Uh, any organism you want. Anything from plants to animals, uh, they're given and shown on this chart. These are the variations found in life. I'm just showing you that there's variation found in nature for this molecule. And we can ask the probability of forming a functioning cytochrome C molecule. If we take a look at the human uh, arrangement, Cytochrome C has 104 amino acids joined together. That doesn't seem like many, but it will form a small molecule which will be used in electron transport. It's one of many molecules used in electron transport. If we ask the probability, it's one part to 10 to the 135th power. Maybe you're not up to math, but that is an incredible probability. This is one followed by 135 zeros. There's said to be only something like 10 to the 90th particles in the entire universe. All the particles. So we exceeded the particles. But you say, but we've observed more possibilities and can form the same molecule. You're right. We can get a, product, a probability of that in the next line, 1 out of 10 to the 999. If we reduce it and say, I can still get a functioning cytochrome, cytochrome C molecule, we can get maybe a functioning one with 10 to the 69th or 10 to the 55, depending on how you cut this. Calculations have given various answers. What's the take home message? A small molecule like cytochrome C, and it's one of the smaller protein macromolecules, has a problem of forming itself probabilistically. What I will have a trouble with is, I have to be able to take this chain of, of amino acids, join them together, and then have them fold together into a proper ball to make the functioning pocket that makes this the enzyme. No one exactly knows the probability. But somewhere along the line, there's something said to be about 10 to the 45th organisms that totally lived if the Earth is 
4.5 billion years old. So we're still far, far, far short of the proper number of organisms to even hit the probabilities that I show here. Where does this come from? Some chemist is trying to throw numbers at you? No. You know what my point on showing you this is just to say, chemistry is small, much, much smaller than life forms. Probability goes extremely high very fast based on one fact alone. The smallness of chemistry compared to the size of the macromolecules to which we are made out of. We will always have a probability problem coming out of our biochemistry. That's the take home message. Now that was one enzyme formation. And this has been debated in the literature and if you want to look that up, you can. The next thing that I want to show you is solids. What bothers me as I've listened to the arguments to for evolution, against evolution, is that it really happens in our world of chemistry. And in chemistry, when we form a solid, it will either be crystalline or amorphous. You may not think much of it, but that is not a large option. There's nothing in the rules of chemistry that allow for the formation of a speci specified shape. Shapes in chemistry are hard to come by. Programming code in biochemistry is used, as well as other reactions are used, to form shape. That's what I show you here. Biochemistry has structured shapes. They're directional. They have purpose. They're mechanisms for development. They're varied, these mechanisms, and they're always complex. I invite anyone to find in their biochemistry book, if you would read it, how complicated the shape forming processes really are. In order to form something with a shape, it takes an enormous amount of biochemistry to do it. That's the take home message. You're not using the laws of chemistry to do it. You're using biochemical information as well as biochemical reactions to form any shape found in biochemistry because there's no rules in chemistry to form shapes. So here's the problem. I use chemistry, but biochemistry has different shapes and it uses an complex amount of chemistry. This is the same problem that I alluded to earlier. There are no directions or control in chemical reactions. They run out of control. Yet biochemical reactions are in control because a great deal of information is being used in order to control the reactions. This is how life actually functions. Inside biochemistry, we have a great deal of complex biochemistry to make the thing work. You don't consider this. But just imagine what happens if I get a little thing wrong in the processes that I'm alluding to. You know what we call this? Birth defects, cancer, serious pathologies, all arise from this area. We also have something else here. We have very little understanding today of how all of this works. Here is a problem of chemistry. We're running in the field of chemistry. We don't have good answers. So let me summarize it. The basic problem of shapes is that we have fitting parts. I showed you the picture of the enzyme. The enzyme actually is what controls all the reactions. If you remember my biochemical pathways chart, I showed you a thousand enzymes that are necessary for our biochemistry. That's the essentials parts. And every one of those enzymes controls and regulates our chemistry and mediates it. They make it work. Without the enzyme, it wouldn't work. The enzymes have a tolerance window in shape. How does that? They're a pocket to which the molecule must fit. Sometimes that window may be a little bigger and there may be some tolerance and sometimes it's extremely tight. And that's where we get the chemical, biochemical selectivity that is needed to control our reactions. Otherwise, if we run out of, we would run out of control. And I'm going to remind you that out of control biochemistry is called cancer. 
for multicellular organisms. Nope, it's not just shape. Here I'm alluding to two things. One is the shape of the molecule. The other thing is its ability to regulate itself. Because in the biochemistry is a great deal of regulation. And when we lose either the shape or the regulation, we lose control of our biochemistry. Control is an essential part of it. Go back to the picture of the factory. I need finely tuned machinery to make things work in a factory. There's always engineers in a factory. They're always making certain that the equipment is always right. You can't make things without it. You can't have that in a cell without it as well. And you're not getting it, here's the important part, you're not getting it from the chemistry, even though chemistry is the one that actually is running. There's a secret here that it takes a while for a biochemist to understand. I'm going to stop just for a moment. The secret is, with a complex set of biochemistry, I make it work. Without the biochemistry, it doesn't work. If you lose your regulation, the reactions start to run out of control. That's exactly what cancer is. Yeah. It is cells uh, reproducing too fast. But isn't that due to the corruption of DNA to It is certainly a corruption of something. And only thing that is important that you have to take home is that it is very easy on a complex process that has tightly controlled regulatory speeds. As soon as I change any one of those speeds or change anything, either the product or the, uh, that's coming out of it or the speed at which it occurs, both are true, I will have trouble for life. Um, what's the important part? It's easy to break. That's what I'm getting at. Therefore, if it is easy to break, it is hard to make. That's the point that I'm driving at. I'm going to briefly mention you organics are good. You go to the store, you get organic molecules, you eat a lot of food. Much of what is growing on the earth is food. That's why we have this whole thing about natural foods. If evolution was true, you would expect plants to form toxins easily, and they can't, like caffeine. Caffeine's an alkaloid molecule. Uh, Nitrogen-containing ones, alkaloids, are often poisonous. They, would ver they work very well as herbicides. Why don't we see more of this in nature? If evolution was true, we would see it. Just, just a thought. Let me discuss something now that is rather different. I'm going to go to a next section. And as I briefly touch each of these points, can we make Darwin's engine? I gave it to you. Did you notice the, the picture I gave you of Darwinian evolution? I started with a set of organisms. They modified in the environment. I never told you where things came from in the beginning. What we have here is we have a complex set of chemistry that is going on and is part of the reproduction cycle. How this works. Could it make itself? Can evolution make itself? The engine has many parts. Remember that DNA, which is often touted, is just the information storage part. There's a lot more to it than the information storage. There's getting the information out and using it properly. And where, did the information come from? where did the information come from is another question, but there's a great deal that we must consider. Um, everything has to fit, and I've mentioned to you the tolerance windows as well. Time here to ask another question. Um, could evolution make the engine? That's a really hard one to do. Can you make yourself? No. What about a primitive engine? Realize what we have in life is a four-dimensional with time. That's a, that's the fourth dimension. Copier. It copies and does so over time units. This is development. What I didn't allude to earlier is chemical reactions that are timed are really difficult. Life organisms time. They turn on, they turn off. 
They have all of these processes associated with it. In a primitive life form, if there's such a thing as primitive, we'd have a problem with the timing. We'd have a problem with um, the control. Can you imagine too much mutation? I may have a perfectly good thing that would be a step in advancement of life, but too much mutation occurs and, the, and it's lost. What happens if I have too little mutation? Well, then I don't get a change. We have here, interestingly enough, if we take the evolutionary picture, all the basics are identical for all life. It never changed. If we accept that picture just for the sake of argument, which some people deny, but just for the sake of argument, we can accept that picture. Remember, this means that it had to be right to begin with from the beginning. We don't see any change from any of the organisms. How do we make it? It, it doesn't seem to be that it made itself that way. When did it do it? At the beginning? It worked really well from the start. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to talk about quality and control. Biochemistry is under enzymatic control. There's little switches. The enzymes are actually controlled by switches. They're on or off. They regulate their speeds. This is essential to life. I've mentioned that several times. If you take a course in biochemistry, they will certainly teach that to you. The Difficulty is, Darwinian evolution says that we make new chemistries. At first, we would expect there to be very little regulation, and then more regulation would be built in. But regulation seems to be essential to life. I have a problem with it. But how do we make Darwin's engine itself? Well, I'm going to ask a question. Was it made in the lab? You're joking. No. How do we do it in the beginning? This is actually a serious position, and I will show it to you. Was there then a chemist or a biochemist in doing it? Let me tell you about organic lab. Organic lab reactions are through solvents, strong reagents, reactive reagents, strong acid base, heats, uh, various heat sources, purification apparatus for separation, and we use glassware to do it. If you go to a biochemistry lab, you'll find a refrigerator and freezers to hold our life chemicals. Um, there's a different set of reagents. Yes, they are. Very different stuff. We worry about proteins. Proteins are your reactives. They cause things to happen. The enzymes, they have shape. Um, we separate through centrifuges, and you have to be very careful to work with these. Very different way to do it. Our life chemistry uses the biochemistry lab, but it doesn't seem likely that it all formed at once. I'm sorry. That's the way it looks. Was it made in the lab? Gunnar, are you kidding? Well, I'm going to just ask you to, to hold that thought and go on to the next one. A big balance can occur. And I believe that we see big balances, and I'm not here to try to prove a creator through this thing, but they're the sign of a creator. Why am I mentioning this? What I mean by big balances. If there's an evolutionary process over time and things were set up balanced and the evolution is really strong, it would remove the balances. Okay, we have balances. Plants versus animals. Why didn't the animals eat out all the plants? Or why didn't the plants form poisons to kill all the animals? Yet in a big sense, on Earth, there's our balance. Just asking the question, you'll see why I bring up the balance, just as a thought. In answering the question, where did Darwin's engine come from? Very quickly, through an abundance of organic molecules, we got a self-replicating RNA molecule. Often this is said to be the way it is, except self-replicating, and it also forms information storage. There was a primitive Darwinism that occurred. There's a gradual transformation from RNA, which is the first form of, of genetic storage, to DNA, which is the one that's used inside our cells, and then cellular life diversifies. This has been said to be the way that life has developed. Um, is it possible for a molecule? 
because people have talked about self-replicating molecules. So let's take on that idea. Is it possible? First of all, molecules are too simple. Even the most complicated protein molecule does one reaction. To get life working, I need thousands and thousands of reactions. There's been a search for minimal life, minimal life forms. Uh, the smallest that we have um, has half a million base pairs for the minimal life form. We can't get it any smaller than half a million base pairs, and that has a minimal life form. Thou uh, hundreds of enzymes are still used in there. Therefore, the whole concept of a minimal reactive form does not seem, from a chemist's point of view, at all reasonable. Yet it is found often in the biology textbooks. It is an error that a chemist cannot accept. I'll we'll skip this for the sake of time. I'll show you several quotes. This is from Gould. Stephen J. Gould has written a lot on evolution. And he says this, No intervening spirit watches lovingly over the affairs of nature, though Newton's clock-winding God may have set up the machinery at the beginning of and then let it run. No vital forces propel evolutionary change, and whatever we think of God, his existence is not manifest in the products of nature, and he's referring to biological life. Stephen Jay Gould actually was a kind of a deist and was open to the possibility that God started it all and then left. That was his point of view. So that's one answer on how it started. He also wrote this uh, concerning um, life, that evolution is a tinkerer, not an engineer. I asked just one question. Is anything I showed to you in the biochemistry pathway, look like a tinkerer? Answer, no. I break one part of that pathway and I kill the organism. There's no tinkering at all in biochemistry. This is a perception of someone who is in the biological field, but not a chemist or a biochemist. There's no tinkering at all. I don't consider the quote to be true. Chemistry doesn't support this point of view. Here's Francis Crick. You may recognize his name. He's the one uh, who uh, co-discovered the structure of DNA. He says this, an honest man armed with all the knowledge available to us could only state in some sense the origin of life appears to be almost a miracle. In his book, um, Life Itself, he gives us two possibilities, that life could have began in a pond through natural processes, or it came from other planets, aliens. Um, and he writes that, it, uh, that with more planets, there's an increased probability, and it had to be through higher civilizations, created life, and this he calls directed panspermia, bacteria, go farther. Now, I hope you realize that this opens the door to God as a creator. There is a higher intelligence. There is a possibility that God made life. And so he actually opens the door as well, just like Gould did, to the possibility that we began the Darwinian process through intelligent agency. Just to show you that here's an atheist who does this as well. Balance. I've tried to show to you very, very briefly that chemistry uh, and biology can be at odds. That what is taught in biochemistry and biology, uh, in particularly concerning evolution, how it tends to improve life, chemistry does the opposite to life. It really does. And I have seen this and pondered it. And I have to ask the question, how strong are each of these things? And that's the reason for this whole lecture. You may have not got, why did I show this? Because the essence, remember I started, here was a question I asked how strong, what direction? Here comes the answer. Or maybe. There seems to be something that pushes in one direction in biology and something that pushes in another direction in chemistry, that is life chemistry. 
And these seem to be somewhat balanced, at least to some extent. There's a tug of war. It looks like chemistry wins out for each organism, doesn't it? Yeah, we die. Yet, on a species level, organisms, because they reproduce, cheat this process and go on. I want you to ponder that. Think about that very carefully. That's that because Darwinism is adding philosophy to science. So let's fairly add a step here and ask what would happen that organisms are appointed to die, but life continues on. Does it look like chemistry, which is given to decay and death, and ultimately some said extinction? Notice the quote on the bottom by Isaac Watts. Something is going on, right? I hope you can appreciate this. All right. Where's my beef? Here it is. When you tell me, do I believe in evolution? You're not asking me to accept whether an organism modifies, are you? Whether a bear can develop a white coat from a brown coat, right? That's the degree of pigmentation. I can easily see how chemistry can modify the coat of a bear. I have a much harder time to understand how a feather could form on a bird. Given that it is directionality, its proteins send in a certain angle, and, wind fo and feathers with foils in, uh, in directions, they have to go in opposite directions to build the feather. And I invite you to look in a biochemistry and then in a, uh, in a biology book on the feather to look and think about the process of, could I make a feather? Could I make an eye? Wait, an eye is simple, says Charles Darwin. You start with a, a light collecting cell. Yes, I said a light collecting cell. What's that? Ask a chemist. You mean something that operates and collects light and doesn't burn up? Because my skin is a light collecting organism too, and I get sunburned on it. Okay? And eyes are more sensitive than that. There's a lot going on biochemically inside the eye, not just the optics, which people have argued about. It's the biochemistry and the reset of the mechanisms dealing with retinol, the molecule, as well as other things. There's a chemistry associated with it. Could I just make that? Well, that's the issue, right? What have I showed you in this lecture? Since this is the meat of the lecture, there's nothing simple. Biochemistry is not simple, but it yet uses chemistry. I said chemistry. The rules of chemistry apply. We need coupled reaction. Right? That is, in order to get things to work, I, energy, I have to borrow energy. I need an enzyme. I can't cheat this process or it doesn't work. I have to put several things together in order to get it to work. Or what? Thermodynamics applies and I cannot make it. So I have to have coupled reactions. I have to catalyze the reactions at a proper speed. There's my kinetics. If I don't get the speed up to the necessary level for regulation, as well as speed necessary for the molecules to be present, I don't have it working. Sorry, I don't get crude. I get nothing. All right. There has to be a rate sufficient to overcome the degradations. This is the chemistry stuff. At first, you can imagine this is not important, but you talk about something crude. Here's my problem. If you talk about crude, the chemistry wins at first. I can't advance. Chemistry destroys biology at first. Only later on do I get my balance. Remember, I said they look balanced. I have to design lines. All biochemistry works down lines of biochemistry. I have to build the factory with all its different components. I have to regulate my factory to get it to work for life to work properly. I have to kind of overcome all my problems of supply and waste. I have to do all these together. This is said to be an emergent property of uh, chemistry going into biochemistry. But an emergent property, I have to have it all there. That's why I have a problem. All right.
I'll leave the transport alone on that one. Just for a moment so that we're understood, as I make my point of the actual lecture, I've given you the scientific background. Now for my points. Suppose I asked you to drive to the moon, 50 miles an hour. It's a bridge after all, right? You can go 50 miles an hour on my bridge. It will take you roughly 200 days to drive to the moon. Is it possible? Uh-huh. How much would you need to get there? Could be, right? I could, maybe. With the right vehicle, just just make the moon. Uh, but, you know, there are problems, right? But suppose I could. It just seems right on the lip, the cusp of probable. What if I asked you to drive to the sun? <laughs> well, suppose we just take the distance to the sun at 93 million miles, 50 miles an hour as well. It will take you 212 years if you were to drive. Now, could you make it? A bridge too far. That's what I'm really looking at when I'm looking at this stuff. I'm seeing a transformation from chemistry, which I know as a chemist, to the biochemistry. You're asking me to accept new biochemistry without question. And I'm going, is this a bridge too far? Because that's the way I perceive it. The title of the lecture, remember, why I do not believe. Certain things I believe chemistry forms a barrier to. Darwin's engine is given to change. We see change as part of life. Life must Mute, life does mutate. Life does change. Life has changeability. It must adapt on the face of the earth. That barrier isn't the same as the Gibbs free energy barrier? No, it isn't the Gibbs free energy barrier, but they are barriers the chemistry provide. There are many barriers that I alluded to. Remember, I alluded to many different things. But it's not just an energy barrier. And in doing that, I say, yeah, you could have a limited success. Some things are not too far. Some chemistries are not. But I said some things. Notice the quote on the bottom, by the way. But we have another problem. I am a skeptic. Why? What if my barrier is too strong? You asked me to make too much chemistry at one shot. Life is way too varied. I look across all of life and I see it varies. It's always complicated. Life is good. What do I mean by good? I alluded to it that food is good. It was made designed to be eaten. Plants are made to be eaten. Uh, life looks too well designed, too ordered, too proper, too functional, too well regulated, too well built, no tinkerer. To accept that Darwinism made it all. I can't see the process together. Why did I put them together? Because biochemistry works together. On the bottom, I want, to, I want you to show the quote. This is by George Minnert from 1871. Gould accounts for him the strongest argument against evolution. He has written a title in a chapter following his first chapter. The title of it is the incompetency of natural selection to account for the incipient stages of useful structures. What does he mean? This is the dilemma of the beginning stage. It makes sense from a chemical point of view. We can't have, if chemistry holds back biology, we can't have it simple. Okay, what then is evolution? If evolution appears to be a balance to the, should I say, corrosive natures of chemistry, and what if it appears to be a setup in life? This setup of evolution, this form of evolution, adaptation, is evidence for a creator instead. It's not evidence there is no creator. I want to remind you, the Bible says that all things were created by him. Oh, yes. Part two. Did I promise you part two? There was a part one, now there's a part two. There was the problem of chemistry, and now this is the problem of the chemist. When people talk about, I don't believe in evolution, I often answer, look, I've met God. 
I'm going to just mention this very briefly, why I would bring this up. I've spoken before to, to UBF, and there is a realm of science where science operates, and there's a realm of where religious texts like the Bible work in, and there's a small overlap, but it's not large, between the two fields. Science deals with information and facts and details, but religion deals with something entirely different. That's the point. The theme of the Bible is far more personal and far more important. This comes to the problem of the Bible. I have one here. I was a student at the University of California at Berkeley. It's my junior year. And I was, as a chemist, I was going up to the chemistry library to read a journal. The Gideons were on the campus, and I saw them. And in seeing the Gideons on the campus, I decided to say something in my head. I said, save it for the sinner. And I meant, save the Bible for the sinner. I walked on. I walked right past the Gideons. They didn't get to hand me a Bible because after all, I went to Berkeley. I knew how to avoid literature. You be there for a little while, you know how to avoid literature. You wait for someone else to step between the person handing the literature and you escape scot-free. So I thought. And that's exactly what I did and intentionally did it. I hadn't gotten but 10 steps beyond when into my head comes the voice. Right inside my thoughts. Uses my name and tells me, pick it up. And was referring to the little green New Testament that the Gideons hand out. I did what, all, what people normally do. I walked on. That's right. And as I walked on, I began an argument in my head over the Bible. And I said, I have one at home. His voice returns, says, you don't read it. Well, that's true. I wasn't reading it. I had a Bible on my shelf. Um, it doesn't matter what type it was, but I didn't read that particular version of the Bible. And then I said, I'll buy one. Look, I could have gone back and picked up a Bible, right? And I'm saying, I buy one. And this voice answers me, no, you won't. And I stopped and I thought about it. And I realized this voice was correct. And I was wrong. I would not buy one. I walked on. I went to a grove of redwood trees, which was my destination I wanted to walk to because I liked the grove of redwood trees early in the morning. It was somewhat peaceful. And in that grove of redwood trees, someone left a Gideon Bible. He was on a bench. And as I looked, I saw it. The voice comes to my head. My name again. Pick it up. And I looked at that thing. And I put out my hand. And I pulled it back in. Pulled out my hand. And pulled it back in. Something was going on, wasn't it? I was handicapped, wasn't I? Yeah, you better believe I was handicapped. Paused and walked on. Got to another Bible. Had to cross the stream, the creek. Someone left it on the bridge railing. The name comes out again. Pick it up. I see that. Someone left it on the garbage can on a water fountain. I hear that. Same thing again. As I march up to the stairs of the library, I am disturbed in my soul. Something's wrong. Something's terribly wrong. I go to the library, pick up my journal article, The Problem of the Chemist, The Problem of the Bible. I find my article. But I decide to sit, not at the nearest desk. I could have sat at the nearest desk. No. The furthest one was in the sunlight. I'll sit at the furthest desk. They're all covered. There's a, there's a front and front. I couldn't see what was on the desk. 
I get to the desk. What do I find? I find a Bible. What? Someone's obviously been picking this stuff up and, and leaving them all over the campus. This time I hear something else. I hear my name. Gunnar? Last chance. Instantly I know what it meant. I've been arguing with the God of the universe, and I knew it. There was no doubt. Don't tell me there wasn't a God. I knew there was a God. Don't tell me he didn't know who I was. He knew who I was. I'd been arguing with the God of the Bible, and there he was. And he wanted me to pick up a Bible. Was I going to do it? This is it. I opened the front cover of the Bible. You know what's written in the Gideon New Testament? John 3.16. I looked at it in the different languages. Looked at it in English. Funny thing is, it didn't read the same in English. I'd heard it and I'd gone to church. This time it read, God so loved Gunnar that he gave him to whom? Gunnar the sinner. He should not perish. I looked at that Bible. And it did something that people need to do. The problem of the camel. The problem of stubbornness. I repented. I turned around. I decided to pick up that Bible. I began reading it. This whole thing that we've discussed misses the essence of the Bible, of religion, Christianity. Do you call yourself a sinner? I didn't. I'm certain God rolled his sleeve up and let me have it. I don't know why he did it that day, but he let this chemist have it. He let me know the good news of God. I had to read it in the next year. I had to really study it. I took a look at it. Every person needs to go open the Bible and read it. I was really surprised at what I read. All the arguments I get today don't mean anything. The Bible doesn't address those things. The Bible addresses who you are and what you need to do with God. I realized that as I read the Bible. At the end of my year, in the senior year, in, in the senior year, I bent my knee and came to God. Here's how I summarize this. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. I've shared with you the biochemistry. I ask you to look at that and tell me, doesn't that summarize it? And I share with you with this second verse. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now I'm open up for questions. And uh, I hope I've given you something to think about. No, cancer is always this, the loss of regulation. Um, the script is, is not the essential part. The loss of regulation, for whatever cause. No, it, no, there, it, cancers are often made by about 10 different uh, things that are wrong. You got to get a set of different things that are wrong in order to form cancer. So, is it multiple parts of the DNA, or is it just multiple parts of your body's biochemistry are failing? The control mechanisms to keep things into order are failing, and that's why no cancer is alike because that failure part it, there's it, it's multifold. It is multiple parts that go wrong. One thing going wrong, you could probably live with it. Multiple things, and you will get cancers. I illustrate this to show you that regulation is the necessity of life. And without tight regulation, there can't be life. This forms the tolerance windows of life. The imagination that I could easily form new biochemistry without the tight regulation. Cancer speaks against it. You can't do it. It leads to death, at least on multicellular organisms. 
it's harder to form new chemistry than one thinks. That's the point of sharing this. Yeah. That's why I say there is, in some cases, a bridge too far. I can never see it that you can make new biochemistry. I stumble at that. That's the instance of this whole lecture. That's the reason why I gave you all the detailed parts and went through, and in summary though, through the detailed parts to show you I established the case, and then only in the end did I show you that's why I stumbled because all of it together causes me to say no. And why I say no? I don't say no over things that are modifiable, like skin pigmentation, or little things like sizes of organisms, or even changes between the squirrel on one side of the Grand Canyon on the south side versus the north side and how one is more red and the other is more gray. I don't have a problem with that. And how they don't really want to breed together. I don't have an issue with that. I have an issue when you ask me how the eye could form, how a feather could form, how we can change and make rapid changes in life organisms and then say it's all just a little change in the body's biochemistry when I know that many things have to change in the body's biochemistry in order to make, or in a cell's biochemistry in order to make it work. That's why I have my problems. It takes a lot to do the changes. And that's what I was hoping to illustrate in this lecture. And I hope to give everyone just a taste of that uh, and why as I, as a chemist, who knows? What did I know? And what's the summary? It's actually chemistry at work, but when you build it all together, it becomes biochemistry, but only when it's fully built is it biochemistry and then operatable. It's not operatable in the chemistry form itself. That's the issue. That's what I was trying to illustrate. That's why this argument is so hard and that's probably why it isn't often presented because it's too difficult to get people to see the picture. Well, I mean, I saw mostly that you presented multiple components of it, but to me it felt like a string, well, it didn't feel like one thing, well, like a string of multiple details. And I mean, I get what you're trying to build in the end. Just, in the like, end, you know, I put them together, I summarize it. Out of the string of the different ones comes the argument. That's the problem. To me, I feel like it's similar to an argument to the entropy that gives the energy, like, you know, it shows you the guidance process. To me, there's enough details that it's like, it kind of, you already pointed to the guidance process because the second one just like less and less. And that's the meaning of the guidance process. Ah. The guidance process. I want to remind you why I called it what I did. Why, as a chemist, I do not believe. Yeah. Not why I do not believe. I have been often asked the, the question, you're a chemist, how come you don't believe in evolution? This is my answer, why I don't believe in evolution. Why a chemist would answer this way, but someone else would answer in a different manner. I, uh, I don't expect people in the biological community to understand necessarily the details of the argument or to appreciate why chemistry would be an opposing force to evolution. But nevertheless, uh, that is the way it does come out. Yeah, I thought the plants were strong argument because, you know, generally, why would a, why would a plant play itself to eat? And no, the uh, plant argument is, is a little more detailed. If plants have the ability to mutate and make things like caffeine and alkaloids, which it, it was just a four-step process. People would argue that's a pretty simple one, just four steps, and there we go, right? Uh, I can make an alkaloid out of it, and alkaloids are poisonous. You eat too much of them, ugh, you get sick. Um, that'll teach you for eating me. Um, great, except plants don't seem to have a lot amount of that. They are edible. A great deal of the Earth's uh, biosphere is very consumable saying that it was made to be eaten. And that's the way it looks to be. It could have poisoned itself if evolution was true. Remember, remember what I said. If there's a balance, and things were put into balance, and if evolution had, was really seriously powerful, it would be able to take things out of the balances. I don't see that. Well, I am assuming that it started that way, but you see, if it is in balance, and it's never gone out of balance, suppose I say that the life is, the, the life is 4.5 billion years old, but in that time period, it's never really gone out of balance. That says something about it. It says that you can't change it that much. It says that although there's a great deal of variation, uh, some of it doesn't change, like the Darwin's engine itself, the reproduction system in a cell doesn't change. 
whereas the other parts do vary, and they vary greatly, how do we account for all of these things? Well, of course, biologists have answers to that, but they're not appreciating that it has to be done in the field of chemistry as well. And this is this is lecture is an attempt to, to bring in that, not to cloudy it, but to remind people of the great difficulties that are associated with this process uh, that makes it so hard to accept. Well, thank you for bringing that up. But physics provides the foundation of chemistry, but this is not a foundation of chemistry. It is in the field of chemistry that this is occurring. It is actually chemistry that it occurs, not a field of chemistry that is a foundation to it. That's where people usually perceive it as. I didn't teach it that way, and it is not that way. It is chemical reactions that are occurring. They are organic chemical reactions. They have to, they only change and look differently in the field of biochemistry because of the nature of enzymes and control and other things that make biochemistry the special field in which it is. Not because chemistry in life organisms is special. Well, I feel like what you're saying is the parts themselves have rules and that the chemistry, they don't follow the chemical rules that I'm believing you're saying? No, the quite contrary. The chemical rules obviously dictate what you can do. So there are immediate limitations. You can't make new things. That's what I'm saying, but the evolution is saying that it wasn't strict those rules. That's why you think you disagree with the rules. No. What did I say I disagreed with this, and this is the essential recap, is the whole sum together I cannot accept because biochemistry only begins to work as a whole because it is a complex set of different chemical reactions, a system that go together. And only when they're all together can I get it to work. It's all together. It's in Michael Behe's concept of irreducible complexity. This is a level of uh, complexity that even exceeds that which he wrote about in this book. The biochemistry, in order to function, has to fully be present in order to work. It, before it is fully present and working, it's just normal chemistry, and it's not helpful. That's the point I'm making. That's a little different than is normally presented, and I'm saying that's true. Because before I get a functioning eye, what do I have? A functioning eye requires something that can take a molecule, uh, that can take a light uh, photon, it, it can strike a retinal molecule, it can change it, it can then measure, transmit that into a signal that gets sent to the brain to interpret. But it has to do a lot of different processes in order to do that. That molecule then has to be reset and work all over again and not be destroyable by the light. Since much biochemistry is, is destroyable by light, we have to be very careful, but even for something as simple as the biochemistry of the eye. Now I'm into trouble. If I talk about, and I mentioned the structure of the feather, I have to be able to lay protein in a certain direction and then stop and then lay protein in another direction and stop, lay protein in another direction and stop, and do so in a, in a complete pattern to develop an airfoil feather useful for flight. Say, but don't we fly with flaps of skin as in a bat? The answer is, bats do fly. They have their own problems that have to develop. But feathers are a different matter, and they're very hard to understand how they could possibly be even formed. That would be something that I would stumble over. Because you'd have to have the control to make the thing. Spatial dimensions are not easily done. Then you'd have to get it to work, that it is structurally strong, and yet in this right pattern. And no one knows how it happened. Yet there is biochemistry of the formation of feathers. There are many things like this problem that I would look at and say, it looks too hard from the point of view of a chemist. Don't say that this looking at the DNA itself and saying that the script I say to you again that you're wrong about your concept of DNA. DNA is just an information storage system to which there is a lot more than the storage. No, I'm saying in their case, when they're trying to make up a story no. about no. how would they No. There's far it? more than that because I have to worry about um, in making something like DNA, I just get the code for the protein. Yeah. But the protein is worthless if it piles together in a ball. I have to be able to put that in a directional pattern. And almost everything I shared with you had to do with shape. 
and there is no rules of shape in chemistry, though I am using chemistry. It is the rules of how I form shape in biology that is very important here. And the rules are not easily understood, but they have to have a turn-on mechanism and a turn-off mechanism. I have to have then switch a direction to make the feather, and I have to switch it again. So I go in one direction to make the main barb, and then switch it, and make the mi minor ones, and I have to lay them out, and then do it again, and I have to switch back and forth until I get the fractal pattern of the feather. Uh, this is not so easy to understand how it's so tightly regulated, or the pattern in a leaf, or how you can get your father's nose on your face. All of that is actually, by the way, more complicated than DNA. Trust me. No, I'm um, no. There, in addition to DNA, there there are other places codes come in, and epigenetic. It, it would be the reference to that information. So we have, in addition to DNA, other epigenetic uh, sources of biological code. Not gene expression No, it's not out of the gene. Epigenetical means that it's outside of genes. It comes from the mother. So it's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you that, that uh, these things are far beyond what is normally described. And it's actually much more difficult than is normally perceived. And is, it is, in fact, one of the essential stumbling blocks of why I, as a chemist, have a great deal of difficulty with the theory. And I've not even mentioned the other parts. And I'll, I'll allude to another part. I mentioned briefly the regulation part. Who cares? Well, I've spent time with chemical engineering. All chemical reactions run out of control. They have to. That's the nature of the kinetics versus the thermodynamics. Yet all life chemistry is in control. You don't think much of it, except that that out of control process doesn't mean that I just make too much of it, but I won't get it right. And there is a tolerance window, and that's what I was alluding to in terms of temperature. That is the kinetic information. That's the refrigerator aspect. There's a tolerance window in terms of the shapes. There are tolerance windows all over the place. And they mean that I have a very hard time making something new when I have to hit small windows in different dimensions. That's my issue. In other words, I won't get it right. It doesn't matter that I have a crude. Crude doesn't make sense. I don't get functioning until I get it just about right. So the, windows can't line up with each other? the windows don't line up easily. That's the problem. That's the way it looks. The windows don't lie up. That's why just give me enough chemistry that I need to make new and special, and I will start to stumble over the whole thing. That's the issue. Because if I start pouring out proteins that make feathers, and someone claims they're like down on a duck or a goose, they couldn't fly with that. You know, I, I, pardon the expression, I wouldn't get off the ground. Um, not... Not that way. The bat could be an exception, but the bats have a hard time flying. But they fly with a wing foil structure anyway. And they have muscles that enable them to do it. But the feather is what gives the bird the advantage above all others. Because it is unique being strong, light, forms a good airfoil, and everything is that is necessary for flight. Now flight, if you, uh, if you ask the biologist, was developed independently four times. Mammals reptiles, insects, and birds. All separate. All have developed the ability not just to fly, because if I don't give you control mechanisms, uh, crashing in flight is a serious thing. It usually leads to death. So we need to be able to have muscles that are under control, and understanding has to be given to each of the organisms on how to do that, and, and a lot must be given. Um, you try hang gliding and see whether you make it on your first attempt off the cliff. There's a real good chance you're not going to make it. Others would jump off, and I've seen hang gliders jump off mountains. But I've seen it and said, I could never do that. I'd die. I'd die because I don't know how to fly one of these things. Make one mistake and I'm gone. Uh, there's, many, there's many levels of argumentation and many levels that have to be right. And these are all serious. There's no such thing as crude. That's why we have this Minert's argument about the incipient stages. 
they don't make sense from the point of view of a chemist. That's why I put it in there. They simply do not add up. I either have it work or it doesn't work. That's the way, and unfortunately, that's what we get by the chemist argument. The chemist looks at this and says, I don't like the way this looks. You can, you can imagine, as Charles Darwin did, that I can get a, 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 a crude functioning step-by-step -step process. But when you ask that crude functioning process and look at it in terms of the chemistry, I don't get that crude process. I don't get the tinker aspect. I don't get these other things that I alluded to. You know what I get? Either it works or it doesn't. And that's the reason I bring up this lecture. And and engineers have, have reminded the biologists that they don't like this, this crude concept, because it doesn't work. In engineering, we have always tolerance windows. You make it right or it doesn't work. The product is not going to function correctly the way it's supposed to be. And there's always a product quality control and, and someone checking it. Is the shape right? Does it fall within a certain tolerance windows? Uh, is it doing what it's supposed to do? When the answer is no, you don't, you don't get a chance to improve it. Because what it means here is it didn't work. You'd never step into it. That's the issue. Real life biochemistry is a lot harder to step into uh, than just a, a, a bulk picture of an organism. That's the issue that I'm making. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, give a round of applause. Hey, thank you. Okay. So uh, we also, uh, just a little information about uh, University Bible Fellowship. So uh, here you can see uh, the website. Uh, milwaukeeubf.org uh, and as well as an email address mail at milwaukeeubf.org so feel free to get in touch with us uh, via this our, our website or email uh, we also have multiple bible studies available if you're interested uh, just as we heard the speaker uh, share how the bible impacted his life uh, this is a great way uh, that that you also have uh, in your own life to get to know uh, Jesus and the Word of God in the Bible. Uh, so feel free to join on any of these online studies. Uh, the link is provided on the side here, and you, you just simply join at that time. You just go to that link, and then you'll be able to use Google Meet uh, to join uh, with, with someone that's on that call. Uh, so also, we do have a worship service on sun Sundays at 1030 a.m., uh, there's, if you can go to the YouTube channel, Milwaukee UBF, to watch that, or you can attend in person at uh, 1250 East Hampton Road in Whitefish Bay. We'd be very happy to have you. Uh, so thank you uh, for uh, you know, taking the time to watch this uh, live stream, and we really appreciate this. Thank you.